Consider what you're about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! The dark age of cinema brought with it a wave of movies that focus not on story, plot, or character development, but an overindulgence in progressive messaging. What happens when you don't focus on story, plot, and character developments? Massive flops and a general apathy among the movie-going audience. But what happens when you do focus on story, plot, and character development? What happens when you stay faithful to the source material no matter how difficult it is to adapt? What happens when you have a director like Denis Villeneuve that respects his audience? Join me, dear viewer, as I dive back into the world of Dune and its many secrets. Adapting a book like Dune proved to be a monumental effort. David Lynch did his level best to do so in 1984, but while special effects had dramatically improved by the early 80s after the cinematic achievements of the Star Wars trilogy, the technology simply wasn't there for something as epic as Frank Herbert's Dune. But it's now 40 years later, and we have a little company called NVIDIA that produces some of the most powerful visual technology in human history. Gone are the days of directors like Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and James Cameron saying, hey, look what I can do with a computer. Now that we have people that grew up with this technology, cut their teeth on it, and have actual talent, is when we get the truly epic filmmaking that we all deserve. I seriously wouldn't be surprised if more classic science fiction from the 60s gets adapted. Oh wait, it already is. The Foundation Trilogy is on Apple TV. But you know what I mean. And now along comes a little Frenchy Canuck named Denis Villeneuve who carefully and methodically worked his way up the cinematic ladder. He's worked on very excellent films such as Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049. So he started small with doable projects and worked his way up. Before he could do Blade Runner 2049, he made Arrival, which was one of the best hard sci-fi films of the past decade. It turns out that having hard experience rather than being a diversity hire makes you qualified to direct a film of the magnitude of Dune. Who would have thunk it? Well, unfortunately in Hollywood, the corporate ladder has become sick and twisted, gnarled up into a structure that makes no logical sense. You have directors like Chloe Zhao that get in way over their heads and then are surprised when their films tank. But directors such as Denis Villeneuve, who methodically gain the experience required, ultimately prove how to make a good movie. And what a good movie Dune 2 was. I honestly can't sing it enough praises. While I read the first book, I wouldn't call myself an expert in all things Dune in the way that Nerd Roddick is an expert on all things Lord of the Rings. But I will say that Frank Herbert's imagination through his world building is absolutely unparalleled. I wasn't that big of a fan of his exposition and found the text to be a bit dry and boring. But what he put together is nothing short of epic. This is hard science fiction at its finest. Yet adapting this kind of epic story into a film is an entirely different matter altogether. Like in the book, the movie needed to take its time to carefully craft a deep and rich world full of interesting characters and spectacular settings. The book took its sweet time to craft this deep, rich world. In fact, it took 300 pages before the story truly took off. Likewise, Denis Villeneuve split the film into two parts quite logically. The first film carefully and methodically set up the world, introduced the characters, the various factions, and all their backstories. All this setup was done in order for the audience to properly enjoy the action that we saw in Dune Part 2. Let me do a little plot synopsis without any spoilers. The first movie, as we all saw, introduced most of the characters, the settings, and the precursors to all the action we saw in Dune Part 2. The second part picks up immediately after the events of the first film, with Paul and his mother, the Lady Jessica, beginning to live amongst the Fremen, the local population on the desert planet of Arrakis, after having gotten their ass kicked by the Harkonnens, who are now the sole owners of Spice Production. Now, for those of you who haven't read the book and just think that Spice is the Dune equivalent of shrooms, it's actually more than that. It enables interstellar travel. Think of it like the petroleum that powers your car. Gee, I wonder if there's any messaging here. 
I feel like this movie would have been way more woke had it come out in 2003 at the height of the Iraq War, but I digress. So we get Dune's version of pretty much any guerrilla force in history. Paul and the Fremen pick their targets carefully and methodically until the Harkonnens grew weaker and they became stronger. This is when we get introduced to Fade Rautha Harkonnen, played by Austin Butler, who absolutely knocked this role out of the park. I wasn't too convinced about him even after his performance as Elvis, but man, he's won me over. What a phenomenal actor. He plays the Baron's nephew who is tasked with getting Spice Production back on track and put these rebels in the ground after Dave Bautista's Glossu Robbins failure. This sets up the film's third act perfectly when Fade Rautha arrives on Arrakis and starts laying the place to waste like the Old Testament. This causes Paul to make his big move, triggering the final battle in the film. Clocking in at almost three hours, I felt like this movie could have actually gone a little longer and made more of a spectacle in its third act. In fact, as many others have mentioned already, the third act is very much rushed through. That's not to say it was bad by any means. I just would have enjoyed seeing a little more of the action in the final battle, which was amazing. What I will say is that the film does wrap up pretty neatly and very obviously sets up a third film. So fear not, dear viewer, we will be getting a full and complete trilogy. As with all movies, it's not without its faults. Besides the rushed ending, I felt that completely leaving out certain factions from both the first and second part, such as the guilds and some of the other houses in the Empire, was done out of necessity to keep the runtime down to a manageable size. The factions were a huge part of the politics of the books, but there's only so much you can fit into a film once you get past the two and a half hour mark. The other departure from the book that I've already mentioned in my first video is what they did to Zendaya's character. In the movie, unlike in the book, the filmmakers made her more of a skeptic of the prophecies, which actually was a nice counterbalance to Javier Bardem's Stilgar. Having this dichotomy of two extremes of faith actually captured the spirit of Frank Herbert's vision quite well. In fact, I really liked Javier Bardem's character because he provided much needed levity throughout the film and it wasn't overdone either, it was just right. Another thing that was rushed through in the third act was Gurney Halleck's conflict with Glossu Rabin. Despite being rushed through, it actually was a complete conflict arc. Josh Brolin's character arc was fully fleshed out and its exposition felt very efficient. As others have mentioned, there just wasn't enough of Florence Pugh's Princess Irulan, nor Christopher Walken's Emperor. And speaking of the Emperor, wow, what a miscasting. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a huge fan of Christopher Walken. I even saw him in a Broadway production of the play The Behanding of Spokane. He's a phenomenal actor, period. But you know what you're getting with Christopher Walken. The acting, the speech patterns, and mannerisms. None of that fits in with a character such as the Emperor. Which actually brings me to my point about character development. I think it was a pretty big mistake to not include the Emperor and Princess Irulan in the first film. We could have gotten more of the feel of the internal politics which actually weren't too deeply explored in Dune Part 2 either. Honestly though, these are all very minor nitpicks in a film of this epic magnitude. Dune Part 2 has pretty much destroyed everything modern Hollywood has stood for through the last 15 years in the dark age of cinema. It contains no progressive overtones, no woke ideology, no lazy race and gender swapping, and absolute peak cinema. Going from the early box office receipts, Dune 2 proved to Hollywood and the world that audiences will turn out to theaters if there's a good movie. Combined with the failures of the Marvels and Madame Web, Dune 2 will usher in a golden age in cinema. It'll usher in a wave of cinematic wonder because it proved to studios that storytelling and character development are paramount and they are what audiences have demanded over the last decade. Overall, Dune Part 2 was a cinematic masterpiece. Is it as good as Empire Strikes Back as some people are suggesting? I would say no, because it's different. It's a different kind of movie. Whereas the original Star Wars trilogy had a great story and character development, it wasn't aimed specifically at adults in its universal messaging. Dune is the type of film that is adult sci-fi. 
There is no other way to put it. You could make an argument that it's like Game of Thrones in that it deals with themes like politics and faith in a way that Star Wars never did. Dune Parts 1 and 2 felt like the more grown-up version of Star Wars, and I'm fine with that. I watched Star Wars as a kid, the prequels came out when I was in high school and college, but now I'm ready for more mature science fiction epics, and Dune Part 2 truly delivered that and more. But what do you guys think of Dune Part 2? Did you think it deserved all the praise it's been getting? And what do you guys think a Dune Part 3 will look like? Please do let me know down below in the comments, and as always, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.